to be clear, these boosters were tested on a total of 10 mice, not a single human. And I would say opinion that the companies knew that Spike was toxic, unstable genetically and similar to many human proteins with with all the consequences that you would expect from that. I don't normally use phrases like this, but I think we are standing at the very gates of hell. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Mike Yeadon. Um, I'm a qualified life science researcher, really. I have a first degree uh, in biochemistry and toxicology and have a research-based PhD in respiratory pharmacology. And then I've worked for 32 years, mostly in big pharmaceutical companies. I left Pfizer in, in 2011. Uh, and then after that, I founded, grew and sold a biotech company called Ziarco. But I'm fervently against um, unsafe medicines or medicines used in an inappropriate context. And so some of the things I'm going to say are not favorable to the current crop of gene-based uh, vaccines, and it's for that reason that they're being inappropriately used, and I don't think they have a sufficient safety profile to be used as a sort of wide-spectrum uh, public health prophylactic. No one is paying me to do this. I'm receiving absolutely nothing except criticism, you know, social isolation from my peers. You know, so what I would tell you, the reason I think you can trust what I'm saying is sincere, is that I'm getting uh, I'm paying to do this, right? I have lost work. Uh, you know, I have had people I've known for decades no longer want to speak to me. Um, so I'm very sincere in what I'm doing. I'm warning you that governments around the world and certainly yours locally is lying to you in various ways that are easy for you to establish. If you choose not to do that, there's nothing someone like me can do about it, okay? You've been subject to propaganda and lies by people who are very well trained in how they do that, and I'm a complete amateur. So I'm simply telling you that if you want to check any one of the things I have said, you will find it to be true. And I would point out to you that if you find one thing your government has said, which is clearly not true, I ask you this. Why would you believe anything else they've told you? Don't you think that retired ex-Pfizer guy might have something after all? And if, if I'm right, and I am, then I, I beg of you to no longer assume what you're being told is true. These are what I would call toxic by design. That is, if you were discussing it around a whiteboard in a research office, by the time you've agreed to make a spike protein-based genetic vaccine, you know exactly what's going to happen. They, this is, so these are not rational design. They, they couldn't work and they would likely carry risks and you wouldn't be able to characterize the long-term outcomes, but they did it anyway. These vaccines, unfortunately, have failed to do the things we were promised they would do. They don't stop people from contracting COVID. They don't stop you from transmitting it to others. And they really haven't shown to decrease hospitalizations. Here's another example. The four leading companies that have brought forward these gene-based vaccines, so Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Moderna, and then the, the, the pairing of Pfizer and BioNTech, all four of them decided to choose the most inappropriate part of the virus uh, to make a vaccine out of. So how did all four of them independently, unless, we, unless they're colluding, how did all four of them make exactly the same set of mistakes? No. So all four of them brought forward a badly designed product and they made the same inverted commas mistakes. In the design, there is nothing that limits how long the gene is uh, transcribed to make protein. It could be minutes, hours, days, years. And the third group, I'm very passionate about this because I've followed the research myself, pregnant women. Uh, as I've said this before, since, since 1960 and thalidomide, everybody in the pharmaceutical industry, every healthcare professional, and I would say every pregnant woman, knows that you don't take anything you can possibly avoid. And if you have to take something, you really want to do the research and make sure it's proven safe in pregnancy. Have they done full reproductive toxicology with these gene-based products? No. Uh, and yet you will have heard your government tell you that it's entirely safe. mRNA from the COVID vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, has been found in breast milk. 
And this is consistent with other studies, so there's no real debate about this anymore. The mRNA from the vaccines goes into breast milk. Uh, now, in the initial trials, breastfeeding mums, pregnant women and uh, infants were excluded from the trials. Yet, the regulatory bodies still decided to go ahead and give these vaccines, which weren't tested on pregnant mums, weren't tested on lactating mothers, breastfeeding mothers, weren't tested on infants, yet... Despite this lack of testing, they decided to go ahead. Why did they blag it? That's the thing that really annoys me. If they don't know, they should have said they don't know. And it now turns out it's systemically distributed. So after mRNA vaccine, it goes to your liver, it goes through your heart, it goes to your, in this case, through the breasts, probably through your thumbs and through your big toes and through your ears. It, it probably goes everywhere. It's really a pity we weren't told that. Had I been told that, that would have completely uh, reversed my decision to get vaccinated so that's why i'm pretty cross about this these are an entirely new kind of medical intervention although they've cunningly managed to disguise them under the word vaccine they bear the only thing they bear in common with traditional vaccines is the word that's it there's no other similarity and so when someone says uh, you're being over cautious about safety i will tell you that with any new class of product in fact, every individual version of the products of any new class, you have to establish the safety in trials. As the drug goes through, as this vaccine goes through development, it's necessary to demonstrate that you can manufacture the product consistently so that it is characterized as having in the vial what you say is in the vial. Now, the clinical trials were, was done with relatively low quantities of material because they were going to dose a few tens of thousands of people at most. Um, but when you go into production, instead of it being a few tens of thousands, in total, it's going to be of the order of a billion doses, a billion doses. So this is orders of magnitude higher. What that implies for people who don't know is you can't use the same process for manufacturing the clinical material. It's going to be, you can't, you can't scale that up. So you have to start again and make an, an industrial scale process. When you do that, the stages required to characterize what you have made, that is the drug substance, the, the gene based uh, material. And then when it's been formulated, what's called then the drug product, those two steps, drug substance and drug product, uh, require, uh, I would say roughly half of the entire workforce of an R&D based organization such as Pfizer, I work there, roughly half the people are involved in that later stage of, of synthesis, manufacture, characterization, or all of that stuff. And the reason they've got 50% of their resources over there is it's very, very complicated. So the idea that they manufactured of the order of a billion doses and got all of those processes stabilized, characterized, inspected, agreed by the regulator is for the birds. They did not do those things because it's not possible to do them in under a small number of years. The key point here is that in the clinical trial that Pfizer BioNTech ran on their COVID vaccine, they used uh, vaccine doses that were made with one manufacturing process, what you refer to as process one. But what was given to the public after the trial uh, was not the same type of doses. They, instead, they used a different manufacturing process, an upscale manufacturing process they call process two, and that was what everybody received when they got vaccinated. And now, now the question is, well, what's the difference between these two processes? Does it matter? And, and, and it probably does matter a lot. And, we, and I can walk you through some of the evidence of, of why we think it matters. In process two, they use a different method to generate the, MR, the DNA backbone, okay, where they basically have a DNA template that they've put into this thing called a plasmid, um, which is part of a bacteria. What they need to do is they have the plasmid DNA and they have the bacteria still in that goo and they need to clean that out and purify it. And that's where they've seemed to have done a terrible job. When you're, when you're making a biological uh, medical product or biologic, 
the process is crucial. In fact, some would, some people say the, the process is the product. Once you change the method, you change the product and you can't just assume that it's going to have the same effect uh, on people. So you need to do another uh, clinical trial on your new product. It's not the same product. What, what they claim to have done, a consistent manufacturer, uh, is impossible. And the regulators know it's impossible. And it's clear to people who've read the regulatory interactions between the European Medicines Agency and Pfizer, that's the one I've actually seen because someone leaked it, in November 2020, for example, the technical assessors at the EMA in Amsterdam had listed seven what are called MOs, major objections. And they're all related to the things I've just listed. They did not have control of the processes giving rise to consistent, pure material. Batches or lots are associated with 6,000 adverse effect event reports and some with a small handful. That's not possible to be due to differences in, in sensitivity, not across uh, one and a half million doses per, per batch. The average should be pretty much the same. And yet they're so different, there's got to be a reason. And the reason is it's not the same stuff in each in each of the lot. So I would say it's a criminal manufacture. And I would say, in my opinion, that the companies knew that the spike was toxic, unstable genetically, and similar to many human proteins with, with all the consequences that you would expect from that. The medical intervention was supposed to stay in your deltoid muscle and produce just enough of the spike protein to elicit an immune response and do that for just a couple of days of a week, uh, or a week and then it, its job is done, it's got you ready for COVID when it came. But uh, we know now that that's not what happened at all. The medical intervention goes all over your body, turning your whole body into a spike protein factory and it can do that for months at a time. So the scientists that I've talked to, John, believe that it's exacerbated or supercharged the effect of the formation of these white fibrous clots. We're looking at uh, white fibrous clots that have been supplied by embalmers uh, and they're seeing these all around the world embalmers are seeing these clots and they're seeing them actually in a high percentage of their corpses unfortunately John and they've been seeing mostly over the last three years. I actually have a, a small vial of the clots that I can show the audience live. In the embalming process these are flushed out of the circulatory system and they're collected by embalmers so these have been taken directly from the circulatory system of the recently deceased that means tom that these clots are almost certainly the cause of death yes i think it's uh, <laughs> you get this in your system it's quite obvious it can uh, cause strokes and heart attacks right a piece you know breaks off and forms an embolism for example you can get a stroke here in America, we're a country of 300 million people, and about three, 3 million of us died every year before the pandemic. Yeah. Well, if we've had about 10% excess mortality the last three years. Yep. So 10% of 3 million people dying is an extra 300,000 people dying per year. That's 300,000 extra people dying a year. And uh, I mean, I've seen the, the very raw figures and they are, they are quite worrying because there's excess deaths of the younger people going on, not just in the older population, right. but in the people under 40 and the real peaks between 40 and 64, 65. Now, this, this is something that is uh, highly unusual and highly alarming. Now, when you actually look at these, these figures that we have, they're the same in, uh, in, in Europe in Australia, in, in other places too. And one of the things that I flagged up and nobody's taken any real notice of, and it's even more pertinent now, is that others have pointed out this excess death started and correlates with the vaccine program. Some of the embalmers are actually funeral directors themselves. They, they're a funeral yeah. director and they do their own embalming. Well, uh, one of the ones that, that's in the Died Suddenly movie, she, she is in that role. So she gets a chance to communicate with the families of the deceased. And she says that every time she finds the white fibrous clots, she'll go and ask the family of the deceased, Was, did your loved one get the medical intervention? And she says 100% of the time, John, without fail, the answer is yes. So when your government scientists tell you that a variant that's 0.3% different from SARS could masquerade as a new virus and be a threat to your health, you should know, and I'm telling you, they are lying. If they're lying, and they are, why is the pharmaceutical industry making top-up 
vaccines. They are making them. You should be terrified at this point, as I am, because there's absolutely no possible justification for their manufacture. But they're being made and the world's medicines regulators have said, because they're quite similar to the original vaccines, the ones that are being given now, uh, we won't be asking them to do any clinical safety studies. So let me just say again, the variants are not different enough to represent a threat to you, so you do not need to top up vaccines, yet they are being made and the regulators have more or less waved them through. I'm very frightened of that. There's no possible benign interpretation of this. Um, I believe that they're going to be used to damage your health and possibly kill you. Seriously. I, I can see no sensible interpretation other than a serious attempt at mass depopulation. This will provide the tools to do it and plausible deniability because they'll create another story about some sort of biological threat and you'll line up and get your top up vaccines and a few months or a year or so later you'll die of some you know, peculiar explicable syndrome and they won't be able to associate it with the top up vaccines but that's my belief that they're lying to you about variants so they can make uh, damaging uh, top up vaccines that, that you don't need at all and I think they'll be used for malign purposes and if you don't wake up that's what's going to happen I think during next year all right, so new boosters for young and old. Your, your thoughts, please. Well, I am really flabbergasted, Paul, that the FDA has approved these brand new boosters, uh, for one thing. To be clear, these boosters were tested on a total of 10 mice, not a single human. These vaccines, unfortunately, have failed to do the things we were promised they would do. They don't stop people from contracting COVID. They don't stop you from transmitting it to others. And they really haven't shown to decrease hospitalizations. If the mRNA uh, technology with the lipid nanoparticle delivery system yep. is responsible for all this unusual uh, blood clotting we're seeing, as well as things like turbo cancers, uh, you know, miscarriages, Hot uh, neural damage, myocarditis, all these things. If it is, we've got a problem because Big Pharma is getting ready to unleash a whole bunch of mRNA-based shots next year. Starting, you know, they, they want to do the flu shot, the RSV shot, the shingle shot. Moderna has about 40 of these mRNA-based shots in the pipeline over the next few years to, to push out on the world. So I, I am actually calling for a moratorium. I think that we need to do uh, more of an investigation to check and make sure that the these medical interventions, that this technology is indeed safe before we decide that we're going to pump it into, you know, not just hundreds of millions, but even billions of people around the planet. Yeah, I think that's probably enough to, I hope I've demonstrated to you that from someone experience in the process of biomedical R&D, although not vaccines, I'm not claiming that, but these these kind of products would be the sort of thing I would work on novel chemical and biological entities. And I understand the, the research developments and somewhat the manufacturing processes very well. Uh, and none of the normal uh, processes have been followed. And as a result, they've ended up with um, products that are rushed, uh, dangerous of poor, intrinsically poor and variable quality, and then the uh, moves to inject the population, uh, including mostly people who are not at any risk from the virus, I hope will tell you, even if it's with horror, that this whole thing is a fraud, the entire thing is a fraud, uh, and we have to be incredibly vigilant as I close uh, for not only uh, eventually, hopefully, prosecuting uh, the driving people in, in this crime, because it is a serious crime, but also we must stay hyper-vigilant for what else might be coming.